Discovering our gifts for the mission of the church. Now the first thing we need to recognize and that I would like to share in this workshop is that we are uh, experiencing a time of change. This is a, a change culturally in our society of how people get engaged in organizations, how people give of themselves and of their time and of their talent. We know that healthy parishes, a healthy parish life, depends upon proper stewardship of time and talent. Those are two of what are called the three T's. The third T is treasure, so resources, money, and so on. <laughs> but time and talent are critical. In other words, we need volunteers, we need vocations, we need people to step up to the plate. And that's not always easy. Organization after organization, community group after community group reports that it's increasingly difficult to find volunteers, to find people to be engaged. We think that it's a struggle in the church. It's not just in the church. In fact, in the church, in many cases, we have more people involved than in all these other groups. In some cases, other groups combined. But the need is still there. It's something we still need to cultivate. This presentation is going to be an exploration of this question, the time, talent, dimension of stewardship, and how our parishes and our communities can be more organized for that and more receptive to that in a way that brings in the biblical perspective, but hopefully also gives us a few practical ideas. Now, if there is one insight I would like you folks to walk away with, just one idea, this slide is it. Okay, this is the core. It is the idea that involvement patterns, getting involved, the involvement pattern for people has changed. Not for everybody, but there is an emerging model of involvement. And if we're not aware of that, if we're still operating in the common model, we're going to be frustrated. Recognizing the change and, and not necessarily fighting it or complaining it, just recognizing it and moving with it is going to be a big step for us. The common model of engagement that so many of our parishes have been built with and built their, their uh, activities and traditions with is first you join a group. You show up in a parish and the first thing you do, you join a group. You get involved in a particular group by joining it. Within that group, you get to know people. You build relationships with the people in that group. And then the group, as a group, gives itself projects. And so it does stuff as a group. That's normal. That's what you want to be doing. But you're starting with the joining and the relationships and then moving to projects. That's usually how it has gone. So people would show up and they would join, I don't know, the ladies' auxiliary. And so they would become part of the group. They would establish relationships with other people in the auxiliary. And then within the auxiliary, they would do fundraisers or, or other activities within the parish. That's been the common pattern. You join the group, you build the relationships, and you uh, do projects. And we see this pattern happening almost unconsciously in some of these older established groups in our parishes, because very often what they do is they, they try and recruit new members. You know, I've been doing parish visits in many different parishes, and one of the things I hear from many of our groups is, it's so hard to find new members. Nobody seems to want to join our group. It may not be that they don't want to join your group. It may, not, it may be that they don't want to join any group. Not because they're against groups, but because the involvement pattern itself has shifted. You don't start with the group. The group is important, but that's not the entry point. The emerging model that I'm seeing, I think we're seeing, flips this on its head. People get involved by participating in a project. You propose a concrete project, and people will say, I will get involved with that. Then, as they work on the project, they build those relationships. And when the project is done, People say to themselves, well, what do we do next? 
now that our project is done and we've built these relationships, and that's where the group emerges. It, it gives itself a sustaining leadership to carry on. This is the pattern we're seeing more and more. People will get involved in a project, from there build the relationships, because they're working together on something they believe in, and then they will have the ongoing structure, you might say. So why are people not joining our group? Maybe because they're not interested in joining a group, or they're not seeing that as the entry point to their involvement. You know, the entry point is some practical activity that has a start and a finish. Now, why is this change happening? It's hard to say. I think we can state fairly safely that it is happening. But I think it has a lot to do with the shift in our society around the concept of commitment. What does it mean to be committed to something? I think for a while, for a long period of time, commitment has meant duration. You're committed to something means you join and you don't leave. While I think the shift we've seen now is commitment means we commit to results. Not so much to a process as to the result of a process. Not to a group, but to the purpose of the group. And so when the results are done, they're done. We have fulfilled our commitment. Not continuing is not seen as a failure of commitment. We committed to see it through to the end, and we've done that. And so it's not a question of joining or leaving. It's a question of the failure of commitment is not leaving. The failure of commitment is quitting. In other words, we give up before we've reached the goal. So it's a new concept of commitment that we're experiencing in our society. We're seeing it in all forms of commitment that exist. They're coming under pressure. Uh, certainly those kinds of commitment that are more defined by duration. But this is coming into the involvement patterns even for getting involved in parishes. I think another factor is probably just sheer busyness. People are juggling so many balls. There's so much to try and, and keep going at the same time that we want to have things that have a start and an end, and people are very hesitant to seemingly commit or join to something that is open-ended. You know, that, that just it's, it doesn't have a result that is definable. They feel like they're going to be hung on to or they're going to have to stick around in a way that doesn't give them the flexibility they're comfortable with. Often very good people who want to do something, they want to help but they just don't want to overcommit. They don't want to promise something they can't deliver, and so they hesitate from doing so. So as I say, this is, please, this is the core insight from our workshop. You can leave now if you want, okay? This is the key thing. If we recognize the shift in the commitment pattern or recognize the shift in the involvement pattern, it will go a long way to explaining a lot of the frustration we feel why aren't people joining our group, et cetera, et cetera. This is, I think, very, very important. If we don't recognize it, and if we don't include this emergent model in the way that we are inviting people to get involved, we are going to see, over time, a drop in involvement. Those who are used to and familiar and happy with the common model will see less of them over time is normal. It's normal, people get older, people you know, retire, move on, whatever. But they're not going to be replaced as easily. So we'll see an overall drop in involvement. And that will bring with it an excessive reliance on the so-called super volunteers. The people who are already committed and involved and they're more comfortable with an open commitment. We'll just ask them to do one more thing and one more thing, and they'll take it because they, they want to help and they're good people. So they will build up their portfolio of activity, but that in the, in the long run, that prevents other people from getting involved even more because they look at it, and not only are they hesitant about overcommitting, when they see the super volunteers in action, they say to themselves, I can't do that. There's no way, if that's what being involved means, forget it. They're happy somebody is doing it. They applaud it at a distance. But it, it would just be impossible for them. It's, it's too high a bar. 
Another sign of this overall uh, drop, if we're not um, recognizing the emergent model, is not just reliance on the supervolunteers. It's something I mentioned in my previous workshop, ATSP syndrome, which can set into a parish. That stands for always the same people. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's something that happens in communities, you know, because the common model, those who are comfortable, there are fewer and fewer, and so they get recycled from one activity to the next. It's always the same people. Again, the key symptom, not being able to bring in new people, fresh blood, so to speak, fresh faces. How do we do it? We can do big recruiting drives. We can put up amazing posters. We can give talks from the, the pulpit and all of that. But if our message and our, our request, our invitation to involvement doesn't recognize this change in our culture and in the way people get involved, we will feel frustrated. We'll always have a few, but we can feel frustrated. Yes? Um, I know you're not supposed to in inter inter interrupt your bishop, but you just put into a model what I experienced, somebody told me is happening uh, this week at an executive meeting for the CWL. Okay. And they said that they can't get the women because they are working and it's hard to attend all the meetings. There's mm -hmm. two women now who they've accepted. One, she's on the phone committee, which she can do at her office. And the second one is going to be involved in the books and running the book sale. And they might only attend one meeting a year. But they're given specific projects or tasks yeah. that are well defined. And, 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 and it was just named this week, and and I, I I just I think that's what you're talking about because these other women have said to the, the CWL members we can't attend night meetings. We are we have, we're with our kids at. So, which thing, Father Fred, is in this presentation so far, and we're only on slide number four, I think. <laughs> you're recognizing it. Yeah, this is naming something that you're seeing. Well, you just named the model yeah. of something that I've just heard about. And, uh, yeah, and I think they are going to accept that as membership. Yeah. Now, with regards to the emergent model, uh, the common one we're already familiar with because it's common and it's part of our history. The emergent model is the challenge. How do we adapt? to include the emergent model of involvement in the way we get people involved. Frankly, that's the big challenge we're facing for the whole volunteerism question, for the whole time and talent question of stewardship. That's the issue we're facing. So a key part of our parish mission in general, as we heard at the keynote address on Thursday, is to make disciples. And our speakers didn't invent that. It's Jesus who said it. You know, go and, to all nation, go and make disciples of all nations. That's the mission he gave to the apostles just before he ascended into heaven. And as our, our speakers mentioned, the word disciple in the original language actually means student. It means someone who is learning, and not just head knowledge, but learning a way to live, a way to be. And so if the mission of a parish is to make disciples, that means the people who are coming to our parish need to be uh, treated not so much as applicants for a job, as students. You know, they, it's like the parish, we're, we're on stage. You know, we're doing our internship, learning how to be involved, learning how to be active in our parish life. This is very important. We're recognizing, like students do, I mean, I teach a university, I recognize my students come with talents. They come with skills they've already got. But they're there to hone them even more and already start to, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment conducive to that, to start to develop them even further. So that's the secret for this model. Recognizing that people are coming with talents. They're, they're not blank slates. They have abilities. And if the parish is an environment that allows those talents to flourish, then more and more people will come. It's like any other school. If you know, you're going to a school and you get your diploma at the end, but you haven't actually learned anything that's going to help you in the real life, that school will fail. You know, it has to be able to be applied. 
This, so as my final bullet point, for the emergent model, uh, the parish must be a school, not simply a service agency, where we have skilled people providing services to the consumers. Again, we heard that, that element in the keynote address on Thursday, that we have to break out of that. Uh, we have to help everyone to get involved. In a university, are the students clients? Is the university a service agency providing educational services? Or is it a, play, a community of partnership and learning? Depending on the kind of mission a university or college gives itself, you can really sense the difference as you uh, are a student there or as, a, as you are a teacher there. Now, the common model is good. The people who respond well to that are good for certain kinds of parish tasks. It, it's not a bad model. I'm not judging one or saying one is better than the other. In fact, the common model does have certain advantages. If people are willing to just join and then be given whatever task needs to be done, those are great people to have. You know, you want to have lots of those people. It's just not what we're living right now. That's what we need to recognize. So there are certain skill sets, there are certain activities that a parish needs to have. Without those things, it's like the, the baseline of a parish. If you drop below that, you're not a parish anymore. You're a chapel, you're a mission, you're a mass center, but you're not an actual institution called the parish. There has to be some content to that definition. So because it's a particular kind of church institution, certain activities and skill sets have to be present. And these are, you're going to laugh, some of them are so basic, but answering the phone, somebody has to answer the phone, or at least take the messages, you know. It might be the pastor, it might be somebody else, but it's got to happen. Looking after the parish registers, you know, filling in the names and the godparents and everything else for baptisms or the witnesses for weddings, filling out the for all the various applications and forms, somebody has to do that. You know, it, it, you have, if you're not doing that, sooner or later the government's going to get on your case because you're not registering your weddings properly. I mean, very basic, simple things that have to happen. Maintenance, cleaning. You don't want your parish to be <coughs> filthy, you know. You don't want to have the bathrooms be dirty. You don't want to have the roof leaking. There are certain basic maintenance issues that have to happen. And, of course, apart from all of those, the obvious core service that a parish offers is the liturgy, Sunday Eucharist. That's at the heart of parish life. The Eucharist is at the heart of parish life. So these are just some examples of core services. If you had a parish that was doing all kinds of amazing things but was not doing Mass on Sunday, that would be really strange. You know, you can have a tiny, small parish. It doesn't have a whole lot going on but they're doing the Sunday Eucharist and people, it's the doors are wide open for that. That's a parish, or it's part of the core mission of a parish. So these are, this is the minimal floor, you might say. Basic activities that need to happen. Those who get involved through the common model, they're joiners, and then they just are willing to take on whatever needs to get done. They are fantastic, especially for these kinds of basic tasks. One of the reasons I say that, one of the reasons I know that, is because as I have visited many different parishes, and I've seen them at different levels of vitality, what I've noticed is that as the parish parishes, some of them are under pressure, you know, smaller communities, uh, perhaps less people involved, so they have to let some things go, right? They let things go. Two phenomena occur as we see that, that shrinking, decroissance happening. The first is they rely more and more on the super volunteers and the ATSP thing. And the second thing is they reduce down to the core services, the absolute core that has to happen. And so that's a sign that those two things are, are conjunctive. You know, you keep the core people who are the, of the common model because they're the ones who will also help to keep these various services going. So God bless them. I know communities that honestly, if they didn't have these, these core people, they'd be in big trouble. They are really the backbone, the pillars of their communities, and that is great. But pillars are meant to hold something up. You know, you're supposed to be building on the foundation. 
which is a big part of our talk today. So if you're recognizing yourself in the, the common model, again, as I say, this is not a critique. God bless you and thank you. Uh, without you folks, we'd be in big trouble. So thank you. And how can we get to the next level? The other kind of parish work, because a parish is called to be part of the mission, every parish is given a mission by the Lord, there are lots of other activities that will not necessarily be common to all parishes. Every parish is going to keep its registers. Every parish will have its maintenance issue. Every parish will have Sunday Mass. But not every parish will be involved in dialogue with the local Greek Orthodox Church, because maybe there are no Greek Orthodox churches. Or a parish may be in a part of the city, for example, that has a higher degree of poverty. And so it's going to respond to those needs in a particular way. Uh, maybe the parish has a hospital down the street that's specific, I don't know, for example, for mental illness. So there's going to be some outreach to a very special population that needs support. Depending where we're planted, we have different callings, you might say, as a parish, some which will be largely common and some which will be even more specific. And I have here, see my presentation on pastoral council. So for those who were in my previous workshop, you've already heard me refer to some of these things. And for those who weren't in my workshop, don't worry, it was also uh, video recorded and will be available. Uh, I won't get into all of it again, uh, but in that workshop we talked a bit about discovering what are the local features of our parish communities to see what the mission is, what the challenges that God is giving us in our various parishes. So these this extra work, beyond the basic activities, the minimal activities, those will be situational. They will depend upon external factors, such as the situation of the parish, but even more than that, and this is another, I guess, key insight number two, I hope we can walk away with from this workshop. The Holy Spirit is in charge. We are responding to the needs of our environments, and that's because we're called to serve. That's the general mission God has given us. But the Holy Spirit is not just sort of giving us a mission and stepping back and saying, okay, now you take care of it. The Holy Spirit is actively involved in leading our communities. So the secret to now is how is he doing that? How can we get on board with his project? How the Holy Spirit leads. When we read the scriptures, we see that God sometimes leads by giving people direct commands. Uh, we've all seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, right? Let my people go. So what's the mission he gave Moses? You are to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell Pharaoh some things. And this will be the result. So Moses got a mission. It was pretty direct. I don't know how many of us have had conversation with Burning Bush lately. It's not usually the way God does things, but sometimes he does do it that way. Sometimes there's a direct command. Sometimes it's a calling. There's the, the famous story of the call of Samuel, who uh, was living in the temple. <coughs> He'd grown up there. And one night, he hears this voice, Samuel, Samuel. So he goes to see his master and says, you called me. And the master says, no, no, you were dreaming. Go back to sleep. But he keeps hearing the voice, Samuel, Samuel. It's his vocation he's discovering. The word vocation, it means a calling. He's literally getting a calling from God. And so sometimes God leads us through that kind of inner sense, an inner voice that no one else is hearing, but that is calling us to something. But most of the time, and this even exists for those who are getting the direct commands and the explicit callings, they're also getting this. Most of the time, the Lord leads by inspiration. He moves the heart. He moves us in our heart to find the place where we will experience joy, to find the place where we will experience kindness, where we will be motivated to generosity, where, you know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control means discipline the willingness to work hard at something, to perfect it. Uh, if we're not 
if we're, if we're, how many of us have been stuck in a job, for example, where it really wasn't our calling? We kind of had to do it, you know, but it just wasn't our calling. We have to force ourselves almost. Now, everybody has that at some point in their job, even in their calling, you know, there are challenges everywhere. But the idea is the Holy Spirit leads us in our heart to find the place where our heart can experience the fruits of the Spirit. And I have on this slide Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, which lists the fruits. I've mentioned some of them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are signs that we are where God wants us to be. We can't chase after these things. If we chase after them, though, we won't catch them. But when we're doing really what God is calling us to, these things pop up on their own. They flower on their own. And he leads us to those fruits by distributing his gifts. He gives us gifts, and when we live according to our gifts, we achieve the fruits. Very basic example, okay? Um, who here who here golfs? Anybody here golf? Boy, not a lot of golfers. Okay, this is a bad example. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, golf or any other sport, sports are more fun when you're actually good at it. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, when you're not particularly good at a sport, you might join in just to be with your buddies, you know, but uh, when you're good at something, when it, you have a level of skill that allows you to achieve, but you still need to work at it and, and take into account the various factors involved, you know, there's an element of challenge that provides excitement, that provides satisfaction when it works. And so that's the idea. When we have the gift of playing a particular sport, for example, then we are more likely to achieve the joy and the patience and all of those other fruits that come from it. You win or lose. The two are connected. And it's the same way with the spiritual gifts. If we find out what our spiritual gifts are and we live according to them, then we find the fruits that we so earnestly desire in our lives. Now let me bring this back to the parish. I know this is theoretical. Let me bring it back to the parish. If in our parishes we had a way to help people discover their gifts, because not everybody knows what their gifts are. I'll share with you a story about that in a moment. But if we had a way to help people discover their gifts, and then also, because the parish is a school, right? We gave them a place for them to develop their gifts and use their gifts. Well, the parish would be a place where they're living the fruits of the Spirit. And who doesn't want these fruits of the Spirit? I mean, just joy alone is in short supply in our world. We wouldn't be able to, we'd have so many people wanting to get involved, we wouldn't know what to do with all of them. See, that's part of the secret, I believe, that we can find and that successful organizations find as they recruit. You are finding, because people are volunteers, they're not just paid staff, so you better do it or else, and they're kind of stuck there because they need the job or whatever. People are giving. They're giving of themselves. If we find this way to receive their gift, if we can receive their gift, gifts that they themselves were given by the Holy Spirit, then the emergent model can really start to flourish as well. The common model still has its place, and the emergent model starts to flourish even more. The emergent model, as I said earlier, starts with concrete projects, usually defined with particular results that allow the building of relationships. A good example is this conference. I mean, you know, I have an ongoing team at the diocese, and at one point we said, we're seeing a need in the community. What shall we do? Let's have a conference. Now, the nice thing about a conference is it has a start and an end. It's a defined project. 
And we could give ourselves criteria, you know, how many people do we want to have come? Obviously, we want to have everybody come, but realistically, what's our measure of success? How are we going to put our talents together? And uh, for those who are here who have been members of that team, it's been an amazing team. Everyone has been able to contribute their gifts and talents. You know, part of my gift is I'm a, I'm a pretty good big picture thinker. You know, I can see the overall perspective which is probably a good thing because the word bishop literally means overseer. So I can see over. But I remember during one team meeting, I said to the team, OK, we've got our general theme. We've got our general structure. And now we're getting to the logistics. And I told the team, I am terrible at that. I, I will get lost in the details. I will run away from them trying to get back to the big picture. And we need the details. So can somebody else please take it on? And somebody else in the team said, I'll do it. So I have had the pleasure during this conference of people coming up to me and saying, Bishop, uh, I'm looking for my workshop. Do you know which room it's in? And my answer has been, no. <laughs> I have no idea. But go ask that person. He or she knows. You know, for someone in, in my position, that's wonderful. And it's not just delegation. It's everyone having their gift that they're bringing to the team. And we have a concrete project. Will it be followed by another one? Sure. But we have something so we can say to ourselves, we, we, we've done it. It has happened. And relationships are being built. Skills are being developed. I've told my team, one thing we have to do when we're done, we have to write a manual on how to do this so that the next team that comes along can learn from it. And we can build on it and improve it and transmit it. So that's the idea of encapsulating activity in a box called a project. It's not to prevent things from escaping. It's just to give it a minimal structure. Now, we have projects. That's the key for getting people involved. But what projects? How do we determine the projects that we need? Now remember, there are certain things you absolutely have to do. I mentioned some of those. But the other projects that we're going to do, do we sort of sit down and try and think of them and, and create a perfect model? Maybe. That can be one way, very top down. But sometimes it's good. Why don't we ask ourselves, what are the gifts the Holy Spirit is sending us? What are the gifts that we're seeing emerge from our people? If we can see the gifts that emerge, then we know where the Holy Spirit is leading us, because he's giving us the people with those gifts. So if suddenly you have a group of people who are stepping forward who are really good at you know, a particular kind of music, maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, it's time for a choir. You know, it's time to help build that. It's not a question of a, a pre-planned strategy. It's a question of welcoming the gifts that are coming. And believe it or not, there are actually techniques that have been developed to help us do this in parish communities. They're called gift inventories. Uh, you know, on Facebook now, there's a very popular kind of Facebook post where people will answer certain questions and you find out, you know, what Harry Potter character you are, <laughs> you know, or what Bond girl you would have been, or something like that. You know, you answer questions about your own personal I don't know what Bond girl I would be, by the way. I've never <laughs> answered that. But uh, you answer a whole bunch of questions about yourself, and then it, it puts it through some algorithm and says, well, based on what you've said about yourself, here is a model of who you are that may help you understand yourself. These things have always been very popular. You know, certain magazines, you answer the 40 questions, and you see you know, it's, I, sometimes I don't think it's much more value than astrology. But interestingly, this idea of gift inventories to help us discern our own gifts is something that is mentioned in the scriptures. We find it in the New Testament. There are three core passages. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. That's where we find lists. St. Paul actually gives lists of the various kinds of gifts that the Spirit gives. And so people study these, and they group them together to develop these gift inventories, spiritual gift inventories. 
So if you look up in Google, Catholic gift inventory, believe it or not, you are not going to get some kind of wedding registry or something like that, okay? For Catholic weddings. You are actually going to find these sorts of things. Catholic gift, spiritual gift inventories. Questionnaires, sometimes interview methods are used to help people discover their gifts. Now, I think we all, over time, discover our gifts. Those of us who have kids or, you know, uh, I, I don't have kids, obviously, but I have uh, nieces. And as you see the personalities emerge, you also discover they've got different gifts and talents. You know, and, and you welcome that, and you try and help them grow in their gifts and talents. It's the same thing for us as adults. We have gifts and talents. Sometimes we're not aware of what they are. If no one is there to help us learn that we've got them, then we may not even know we have them. Uh, I mentioned earlier I would share a story. Mine has to do with singing. Um, I, I never knew I could sing until I got to seminary. So I was 25 before I ever sang, really. Uh, I, I got to seminary, and because I was studying in French, and I didn't know any French church music, so I thought, I'd better join the choir. I did not join the choir because I liked to sing. The idea of joining a choir in order to sing gave me no sense of inner pleasure, gifts of fruits of the Holy Spirit, nothing like that, OK? I would never have done that normally. But I had a particular purpose. OK, I'll join just so I can learn some of this French church music, because I'm going to be in this French seminary. I might as well learn it. So I joined this thing. A week later, at our next rehearsal, we got told, oh, there's some big mass coming up. And so we're going to need somebody to, I think it was to lead the responsorial psalm. Now, we're all new members of this choir. And the responsorial psalm, as you know, is done as a solo. So the, the choir director has us, he sings something, we have to sing it back to him. And he gradually whittles us down to who might be able to do it. And at one point, he says, OK, Tom, you're doing the responsorial song. And I went, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, you, you've, you've got a voice. You can do it. I said, are you crazy? I've never. I've barely sung in choirs. You want me to sing on my own solo in front of a crowd of people? I can't do that. I can't do that. And he said, well, your voice says you can. <laughs> I didn't, OK, so I mean, I was terrified, you know? I thought, I can't do this. But I figured, well, I'm being asked to do it. And all right, I'll give it a shot. They're not going to kick me out of seminary if I muff it, so it's fine. And so I worked, and oh, the day I was, you know. And I'm actually pretty good at talking in front of people, but speak, singing in front of people at the time, I'd never done it. And uh, it actually turned out pretty good. And so I, I kept being involved in that. And nowadays, I, I actually really enjoy it. I'm not sure the people listening to me enjoy it, but, <laughs> but uh, I can hit a note. I learned that I can hit a note. In fact, I was once uh, cajoled by a singer in a church who said, so where, where did you get training? I said, well, I've never gotten any training. And then he said, oh, it's too bad. You should have. I thought, is that because I sing badly? Because you think I, you know, it would have been nice. To, anyway, we didn't go into that. But, but the, the point is, we don't always know the gifts we've got. You know, in that case, if you'd have asked me, I would have said, no, that's not one of my gifts. It turned out it was. Maybe not my you know, neck plus ultra gift, but it's one of them. So helping people discover their gifts is it's a real blessing. It's a mission. You know, it's something, it's a contribution to other people's happiness. If we can do that in our parishes, help them discover them, and help them put it into practice, we're helping our parishioners be more fulfilled as human beings. And we're collaborating with the Holy Spirit. When people discover their gifts, they are discovering themselves. And if they are then motivated by a sense of stewardship, they will get involved 
especially if they have some zone of involvement that is tied to their gift. And this is where ministry groups or particular positions of ministry in a parish, if they have a clear results-oriented mission, because we have this emergent model which wants to see projects and results, if you have those and this gifts discernment process, then they come together. I have put here an example, St. Austin Catholic Parish. It's uh, run by the Paulist Fathers. Just Google them. I didn't put the website. They're easy to find. Google St. Austin Catholic, add in the words gift inventory. You'll find it very easily. And they actually have on their website one of these questionnaire gift inventories where they give a list of questions. Do you see yourself doing the following things? And it's not yes, no. It's sort of no, somewhat, yes, really yes. I don't remember what the exact categories are. And from that, the, the system is able to help people discover where they might be able to get involved. Because the result of the questionnaire is a list of all the parish ministries mapped to people's skills, mapped to people's gifts. So that if somebody wants to be involved, they can at least find a place where they'll be comfortable, they can dip their toe in the water. Now it's not a perfect method. If I'd have done that, I would never have checked music as one of the things. So I would not have been given the suggestion of choir. It's not a perfect system. But like a lot of things, usually when people get involved, they need an entry level place to get involved. A place where they can do something simple that they know they can do, and from there, as they build those relationships, it becomes more general. That's the emergent model in question. So we need entry level action zones. Now, the uh, various lists, remember I said there are these gift inventories, and you will find various kinds. If you Google them, by the way, I, su I suggest you add the word Catholic to your Google search, gift inventory Catholic, because the evangelical Protestants, for example, are great at this. They're really strong at helping people discover their gifts, and so you'll find lots of websites from them as well. Fortunately, it's all the same Bible, so one can usually work with another one. Um, I've developed my own model, which instead of having a list of 25 things, I, I brought it down to 10. That's still a lot, but I would like to just explore these with you so that you can kind of see where I'm coming from with regards to these gifts. These are gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament, but which are tied to functions. They're tied to some particular function in the community. And so you've auto automatically, implicitly, got the gift and its active dimension tied together. That's why I like this particular model. The uh, first one is the gift of apostle, the office of apostle. Now, apostle, I mean, we know who the 12 apostles were, but literally, what it means is someone who is sent. Okay, someone who is comfortable going out of their zone and reaching out. Not everybody is good at that. You know, a lot of us are inherently shy. Uh, we might be okay if people come to us. Maybe we won't run away if they do. That's good. But actually stepping out of our zone and going up to people we don't know and saying, hello, my name is, that, that's something many of us would have a lot of difficulty with. But I'm sure we've all known people who are actually really good at that. They're just really good at stepping up and saying hello. It's a gift. Not everyone has it, but some people do. And that is, in its most basic form, the gift of being an apostle, gift of being a herald, gift of being an ambassador. Those were other principles or other applications of this word in the, uh, the ancient world, in the ancient language. Prophets. When we think of prophets, I'm sure many of us would love to be prophets, especially when it's time to buy our Lotto 649 ticket. <laughs> Because we think prophecy means knowing the future. In fact, in the Bible, the person who can see the future is known as a seer, not a prophet. <coughs> a prophet is a person who receives the word of God 
and also is tuned in to what's going on in society around them. And so they're able to speak the Word of God to the society around them. When you read the actual books of the prophets, you'll see most of the time they're discussing things like social justice. They're bringing the principles from the Lord and showing their society how they need to be applied. So prophecy has a very important role. People who have a passion for justice, people who have a, a passion for right living in the world around them and for their own right living, there's an element of prophecy there, especially when it's connected to a love of Scripture, to a love of the Bible. I'm going to tell you a story about a friend of mine in a bit, but we'll just keep going through these gifts. Now, evangelist is on the Ephesians 4 list that's not found in Corinthians. I'll get to that one next. We know what an evangelist is. There were four of them, right? Four evangelists, so we're safe except that we're not talking about the four. Evangelism literally means sharing good news, spreading good news. And that can be good religious news. It can be any other kind of good news. How many of us have those friends who keep sending us those gentle spam messages in our email box, you know? <laughs> Cute stories, or read this uplifting thing, or it's nowadays, of course, they're sharing it on our Facebook feed, or Sometimes they're relentless, yes. You know, these may be people who have a gift of evangelism and they just don't have another outlet to share it with. You know, they've got a passion for it. They see good things and they want to share good things with others. Uh, I, I believe that a lot of people who are involved in journalism, they would love to be able to write more good stories. They're stuck writing all about the bad news, not the good news. They would love to be able to share more and more good news. Connecting a community together by putting people on the same wavelength, that's a big part of what evangelism is. And so there are people who have it as a natural gift, a natural impulse. Pastors, the word pastor can have a technical sense, the parish priest, but in its original sense it means a shepherd. And when you think about how shepherds work, what they do, we recognize there are people in our communities who have the gift of shepherding without being official pastors. You know, a shepherd looking after the sheep most of the time leaves the sheep alone. He lets them do their sheep things, okay? Run around in the fields, eat their grass, make little lambs, whatever it is the sheep are doing, he lets them be sheep. He intervenes when one of the sheep gets lost, he intervenes when one of them is injured. He intervenes when the wolf shows up. In other words, when there's a critical situation, but otherwise, just keeps an eye on them. Just sees how things are going. I submit to you that a lot of our social workers today, social work is a, a profession, but when it's lived as a vocation, not just as a profession, it's pastoring. You know, you're helping people, keeping an eye on them, tabs, how's it going, etc., etc. How many of us, if we're involved in pastoral home care, you know, we're visiting people in their homes, checking to see how they're going. We don't necessarily intervene, but if we notice something is happening, Mrs. So-and-so doesn't seem to be doing too well, then we, you know, we call 911 or whatever. There's a, a, just a ministry of presence and, and helping to accompany. That's a gift of pastoring. Some people are really good at that. Some people are so results oriented, every time you talk to them, you come away with a feeling like you have to do something, that's not maybe the right person for this kind of thing. Would you put parents in that category? Parents are in many ways, yeah. They have to, but again, you know, there are parents who let the kids be the kids and just intervene when things are going on. Others, it's, they're more, the next category, the teachers, you know. Parents have a function of teaching with their kids and they also bring teachers into it. Teachers are people who have the gift to make complicated things simple, or to explain concepts, to help insights be formed in the mind. We've all had teachers. I'm sure many of us can remember a teacher who was just a great teacher and made a huge impact in our life by helping explain things to us, helping make things clear. And I'm sure we've also had teachers for whom teaching was really not their gift. 
<laughs> Sadly, that can be the case, you know. Um, the, but for those for whom it's a vocation, not just a profession, they, they can transform lives. Dynamis, I put it in quotes, this is a Greek word. Uh, literally, it means deeds of power. In the scriptures, it's generally referring, believe it or not, to exorcisms. Uh, Jesus did deeds of power. Uh, that's its strict interpretation. But in the broader sense means undoing bonds, things that tie people down, things that enslave. The person who has this gift of dynamis, they, it's, that's the root of our word dynamism, to be dynamic. In other words, you have an energy that allows you to go out and to address difficult circumstances. Many of us, if we see a, a situation that's particularly difficult, we would hesitate. We would say, oh gosh, no, no, I can't go there. But there are some people who are drawn to that. You know, they see something difficult and they say, I have to be there. A good paramedic has this quality. A paramedic who sees a car accident and says, oh, I'd better call 911. It's not a good paramedic. They are 911. They're supposed to be there. Okay? The, you want the people who are saying, let's go. The house is burning. Let's get the buckets and go. And that's, that's the gift of dynamis. Untying knots, not being afraid to work with those who are suffering. Uh, I think of people who are addiction counselors, for example, dealing with others who are suffering from perhaps real knots. They are bound to help them. That takes dynamis. Healers, I think that one's fairly obvious. Those who are helping others in their physical health, their mental health, the ability to heal uh, doctors, nurses. Some do it as a profession, many as a vocation. It's where they're meant to be. Helper and benefactor, uh, these are two different ways of saying it. Benefactor, we usually think gifts of money, and there is that, but benefactor literally means a do-gooder, someone who does or creates good things. And so very often in this category, it's, it's people who are entrepreneurial. Those are the people who see something needs to happen and they don't need to be given a recipe, they can just initiate. They're comfortable in an unstructured situation to make it happen, to do the good that needs to be done. That's a benefactor. Governance is the gift of leadership. A governor literally means a rudder on a boat, the thing that steers. And so governance is the ability to steer. It's sometimes translated the gift of administration. And then finally, there's the gift of tongues and its interpretation. Uh, we're all familiar with the story of Pentecost, where everyone was speaking in different languages, but also there was a gift given to understand the different languages. So this has a literal application, the gift of tongues, but it also has a broader sense. These are the people who are able to help others understand each other. Have you ever known somebody who, when you explain something to them, you're having trouble finding the words, and they seem to be able to find the words better than you can, and they may act as a mediator between you and someone else to, to help explain a concept or an idea? That's this particular gift. Now, as I say, not everybody has all of these gifts. Uh, I, I think of myself, or I think of my brother priests, you know. I can think of a, a brother priest who, honestly, is a fantastic administrator. You know, I mean, you can bet that whatever parish he's going to be in is going to run super, super, super well. But as a teacher, the ability to explain things struggles more. You know, has to take advantage of outside resources more. It's not as natural. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, people feel, oh, gee, it's too bad he's not a great teacher. Yeah, but he's great at running the parish. Or you might have someone who is a brilliant teacher, brilliant homilist, but they're not comfortable visiting the sick in the hospital, you know, because they don't have that gift of being present to difficult circumstances. Uh, 
we have a tendency sometimes in the church, not just with priests but with each other, sometimes we judge each other by the gifts we don't have rather than by welcoming the gifts that we do. And the interesting thing about spiritual gifts is that they're not meant to be given to us for us. What the New Testament says is these gifts are given to us for us to share with others. That's why we are the body of Christ and not the individuals of Christ. Because we're meant to be bound together by the gifts we bring and share. And that is why I say a parish capable of receiving the gifts of its people and weaving them together becomes a parish that is more and more the body of Christ. And people who want to be woven into that will step up to the plate. Now, I, I promised I would share with you a story about the prophet thing. I have a friend of mine who, uh, she studied uh, theology at a, one of our Catholic universities, and uh, she struggled a bit with it, and she had some personal issues, and so at a certain point she dropped out of theology, and she got other jobs, because uh, she had to live, right? And um, so she had two jobs in particular. She was simultaneously a used car salesman, or saleswoman in her case. So she sold used cars, and she worked nights doing stand-up comedy. So one day we were, we were together and she said, you know, I'm thinking I need to get back into theology. Because, you know, theology, we're talking about, you know, important concepts and big things and ultimate realities. I'm selling used cars, and I'm doing stand-up comedy. You know, I don't think this is what God wants me to be doing. So I said, well, let's, let, let's sit with that for a moment, OK? Your job is to make people laugh. Now, people laugh. Laughter is a reaction to the absurd. To be able to make people laugh, something needs to be absurd. Now, some comedians do it. By just, by just telling, well, sometimes the truth is absurd. You know, we see, it, we see absurd things around us, and we speak the truth about it. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was very good at that. His show about nothing was not about nothing. It was about the little absurdities of life that make us laugh. So I said, you know, your job is to notice them and to raise them. Now, sometimes it's the comedian himself that's absurd by getting up and you know, using foul language and you know, all kinds of other references. But the really talented ones are able to see the world around them in a way others can't and bring it up. And that's, that's a core ability for humor for comedians. I said, and as a, a, a person selling used cars, you have a difficult task because people don't trust you automatically. You have to be able to go to people, to, to welcome them as they come in, go to them, not be too pushy, you know, establish a relationship of trust, have them you know, believe you and all of that sort of thing. So I said, your mission, really, whether it's being a used car salesperson or it's comedian, it's all about truth. It's about finding the truth in circumstances where otherwise it may not be easy to see, and then speaking the truth said, you sound like a prophet. The ministry of being a prophet is the ability to see what's going on, and the prophets have to speak what they see. And they have to be able to, to bridge gaps, because not everybody wants to hear what the prophet has to say, or there may not be a lot of trust. said, so if you can find a way to be a comedian, to speak God's truth into the world in a way that makes people laugh, wow, you, you could you could probably be giving great homilies just through stand-up comedy without even knowing. So I said, you know, I told her, maybe God sent you to study the Bible. Because remember, part of being a prophet is you're receiving inspiration. right? It's not just your own ideas. I said, maybe God sent you to study the Bible so that you can have the word of God in you already. And as you see the world around you, you can speak the word of God into it. So keep studying your Bible, do theology, but you don't have to abandon everything else you're doing. And she kept on with uh, stand-up comedy. You know? So this is the idea. These gifts, they can say, oh, spiritual gifts, wow, you know, that's great for all those saints and everything. No, they can be very ordinary. They can be very ordinary for us. 
we have to be able to recognize them and see how they can be creatively applied. So my dream uh, is for this model of gifts-based, sorry, that's a typo, gifts-based ministry to permeate our manner of living the mission of the church, where all will be treated as disciples, that is to say as students, and all will be helped to grow as disciples in the use of their gifts and by the use of their gifts. And to get there, what we need, first of all, we have to encourage people to be willing to give in the first place. So there's a basic stewardship that we need to transmit. We have to help people discover their gifts, and we have to give people chances to use them. Now this is a big work in progress. We have to, again, thinking of the emergent model where people start with projects, we have to define pastoral projects that have a start and a finish, that have some kind of result associated with them. They can be defined on a diocesan level or a parish level. And those things have to be designed so that people of gifts can contribute their gifts to it. One thing we can also do is bring in external resources to help people discover their gifts. Remember I said people will not necessarily step up to offer their personal gift unless they know what it is in the first place. Just like the choir director did for me, helped me discover it. These gift inventories are great, but sitting there at your computer all by yourself clicking a questionnaire, it's not quite the same thing. Uh, sometimes you have to sit down for coffee with the friend who says maybe being a comedian is actually a gift. You need the dialogue. And so there are actually institutions in our church that help to do this. The one that's best known, uh, or that I know best and is becoming very well known, is the Catherine of Siena Institute. They have resources available in their online bookstore to help parishes do this. And they also will, will travel. They'll come to a particular community and put on a big workshop that helps people discover their gifts. I suspect that that's more a job for my office to do rather than for individual parishes. But don't think I am not thinking about it, you know. Uh, if we can have that as a next step from today's workshop to help our parishes take the next step or go further, it'll really help animate things. But in the meantime, don't wait for me. There are resources available. And of course, we want to support and nurture those who are growing in active discipleship. This can be as simple as saying thank you. You know, when people give something, the results are there, they've worked on a project, how do we celebrate our victory? You know, how do we say thank you to those who have been so involved? The super involved, those who are involved in the common model, don't need it that much because they're already part of a group that is providing the reward <laughs> through the relationships they've built. But for those who are getting involved in the emergent model, some kind of external affirmation that is personal is extremely important. Saying thank you, finding ways to say thank you in a personal <coughs> manner, frankly, is critical, in my opinion, to the success of having volunteers, to the success of having people involved. And it is, sadly, something I have heard in some of my parish visits. I was involved, but nobody ever seemed to notice, so I quit. Yeah, we shouldn't be involved. We all know we shouldn't be involved just for external rewards. But it is nice when somebody says thank you. You know, it is a nice thing to do. And just starting from there is a basic beginning for nurturing. Another one, if we see a volunteer has dropped off the radar, how long does it take till we notice? Does anybody call and say, oh, your mom is sick. That's why you haven't been coming to meetings. You know, little things, little bits of concern uh, celebrating with others on, on good moments, grieving with others, you know, when they're grieving, all of those things are means of support for those who are giving of themselves. So it's a work in progress, but uh, that's why we're doing this Parish Vitality Conference, right? It's to start the work in progress, and I think it's very apropos that we close the conference with a workshop that deliberately says, more to come. So there is more to come. And I thank you for being here and being part of moving us forward.
What time is it? 3.08. So we have some time for questions. By the way, there will be a prayer service afterwards, a brief prayer moment, because we want to close the conference with prayer. So after we're done, I invite you all to go to the St. Matthew room, is it? At the end of the hallway here, for, to the left, out the door, for a moment of prayer. Who recognized themselves in some of these gifts? Oh, come on. Nobody recognizes? A few, a few. Who wants to share what theirs is? Yep. You're a teacher? Your heart is in there. You help people understand each other. Those two gifts often go together because the teacher has to be able to see where the other person doesn't get it, get in their head almost, and then readapt their message. So those two gifts, certain categories of gifts do go together. They inform each other. Yes? Comedy. Yours is, <laughs> well, comedy wasn't one of the 10, but OK. <laughs> Okay. You know, sometimes, jokes will come up and be, you know, be patient or vested, whatever. They'll start laughing at me. You know, I have the gift of comedy. Okay. Like but I wonder if it's comedy as a prophet or comedy as a healer or a pastor, you know? I'm not touching that one. Okay. <laughs> Rosa. No, that's not the only reason. <laughs> Good one, Father. Good one. He said that's not the only reason. That was Father Fred. <laughs> yes, Rosa. The name of the gift you're referring to, that's benefactor. The one who creates, who invents, who builds up something that is good. That's definitely that category. Some people are great organizers, you know. They can just gather a team and, and build it up. Benefactor is definitely a role for that. Was there anyone on this side? People have no gifts on this side. Yes. Teacher. And evangelist. Sharing good news. Apostle. Apostle. That's true. Paul can go up to anybody and say hello. <laughs> but that's part of being a teacher. Yeah. Well, it can be. But, but part of the skill I had is It can be. I, I know some teachers who are actually quite shy until they're in their teaching mode. But then outside of it, like they won't go to it, but if they're given a place, they'll do it. You know? I'm very shy. Yeah, you're shy. Yeah, okay. You stop the camera at that point. Yes. I just wanted to say that I'm a really product of this engaging our model that you're describing. Please, please go on. Well, we started our capital campaign at St. John Fisher two and a half years ago. And up until then, I've just been sort of a regular church goal, but not involved apart from that. Not that I have had some uh, fundraising experience through other things, so I joined this committee. And since I joined that committee, now I deal form the relationships with the other committee members, and now we're talking about what, what other projects can we do. So you actually are a product of the emergent model that I said, where it starts with one thing, you build the relationships, and then it's more general afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, me too. I started like a 
You started like that too. You too as well, okay. So we're seeing that pattern. We're seeing that pattern. If we can find ways to, I won't say institutionalize, but if we can make it more habitual pattern, then we'll have more fine folks like yourselves. And now you're at a Parish Vitality Conference. Who would have thought? I'll tell you, my, my gift that I think, we all have multiple gifts. You know, usually there's one though that defines the rest. It kind of gives a core value to the rest. Personally, I think mine is not singing, it's teaching. Uh, I find myself teaching all the time, you know. When I'm in a meeting, I have a flip chart and a marker because I have to be able to write points and make sure we're all in the same wavelength and clarifying issues and standing in front of a workshop is, this is a joy for me, this is a pleasure, this is not work. And so, uh, you know, I think for being a bishop it's probably a good thing, be a good teacher or be a teacher. I'll leave good up to you to decide. But, uh, you know, administration, I can do, but like I said, logistics, I'll leave to somebody else, you know? I'll look at the big picture instead, that kind of stuff. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to teach and be present with you today.